Hey, it's Jordan with TYT, TYT Politics, coming to you from snowy New York. And I'm here with uh, Glenn Greenwald from The Intercept, uh, doing great work as always. And uh, I read your stuff pretty much daily, but uh, today your piece was outstanding. Uh, it was a broader piece on the Democratic Party still not learning its lesson, but overall uh, it focused in on Tom Perez, who's the DNC chair uh, or DNC chair candidate, uh, essentially made the mistake of telling the truth and moonwalked that back very fast. So uh, I first want to ask you, uh, Tom, Tom Perez, he basically, uh, speaking about the primary, essentially said, yeah, uh, it was stacked against Bernie Sanders. Uh, that's why we need, we need transparency. Uh, the establishment, you know, clobbered him over the head very quickly after. And he, he tweeted, uh, you know, a retraction back, pinned it to the top basically saying Hillary won fair and square, all that. Um, I want to get your thoughts. Uh, does that speak volumes about if he becomes chair, that this is kind of business as usual? Right. It was, it was really kind of an illustrative episode of, as you called them, broader trends that had been percolating, um, at least in my brain, and I think a lot of other people's for quite some time. And it was just a very extreme example because what he said should have been extremely uncontroversial because we all know that it's true, because we all read the emails that proved it's true, um, which is that the DNC hid what they were really doing. And as he put it, as Tom Perez put it, they rigged the um, election in, in Hillary's favor. And Sanders supporters know that, and they're correct about it. And therefore, there needs to be steps taken to regain their confidence. And what he said was very clear and, and not particularly controversial, given how much evidence there is. Debbie Wasserman Schultz and four other officials had to resign because of it. And yet, in the face of this kind of anger over what he said from Clinton supporters, instead of just being honest and candid and saying, yes, I said that because we all know it's true. The DNC acted improperly and we need to make sure it doesn't happen again. Instead, he invoked this kind of slimy politician formulation of I misspoke, which doesn't actually even really mean anything. Um, it's just what they say if they lie and get caught lying or if in this case they tell the truth and make people angry who have power over them. They say I misspoke, which doesn't it's supposed to just like abolish what it is that they said, um, like just make it disappear. And the reason it was significant to me was because it was just this kind of like mealy mouth, transparently insincere talking points, clinging, um, establishment pleasing, uh, just programmed kind of political talk that Democrats are drowning in and I think is what alienates them from, from voters. And so to me, it just kind of illustrated why the Democratic Party on all levels of elected life um, has been failing and collapsing at a very alarming rate, particularly alarming given that you want an opposition to be strong and cogent and effective and not weak and in chaos and impotent and pathetic in light of the Trump presidency. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's interesting because for me, you know, I was at the Women's March. Uh, we have a reporter covering the DNC chair forums. And it's a little bittersweet because on one end, uh, I think it's great that there's this uh, really, uh, in most cases, organic grassroots opposition to Trump and the things he's doing. But on the other end, it, it kind of allows the Democratic Party uh, not to have an autopsy. And you have Cory Booker showing up at the Women's March with a pink scarf and, you know, getting softball interviews by CNN. You have all these Democratic politicians doing photo ops and, you know, floor speeches. But it really uh, it removes the possibility of accountability among these establishment Democrats, which, in my view, I'm not the reason Donald Trump is president. You're not the reason, despite the trolls. It's, it's these politicians that have served up platitudes for years and years and years, but their actions don't match those. Do you think it's kind of uh, a little bit dangerous that although the protest against Trump is good, uh, it's kind of, in many ways, allowing Democrats to walk away from the reason they actually lost? Absolutely. I mean, if you look at the last 12 months, or the, the 12 months leading into the election, or the, say, the six months leading into the election, what you saw was a very aggressive and intense messaging campaign on the part of the Clinton campaign, as well as the pundits, the Democratic Party pundits who serve the Democratic Party, that was very hostile and acrimonious about Donald Trump. They were, it was really a, a very 
assertive campaign, unrestrained about how he's a liar and um, a sexual assaulter and, um, you know, just corrupt and dangerous and you can't let him have the nuclear codes, all things that were basically true and were very aggressive. The problem was that it was almost entirely unaccompanied by any positive messaging, any explanation for what Hillary Clinton and the Democratic Party would do for the people who whose votes they were trying to secure. And what the election showed is that that's not enough. Um, it wasn't like there was this huge surge in right-wing extremist support that elected Donald Trump. In a lot of the states, he performed equal to, if not worse than Mitt Romney or John McCain. The difference is that there were huge numbers of Democratic voters uh, who voted for Obama in 2008 and 2012, who either voted for Trump or in many cases just didn't go to the polls because they weren't inspired to do so. Because saying how evil and terrible and awful Trump is does not inspire enough people to want to come and vote for you. They want to know what you're going to do for them. And what I see since Trump's election is a repeat. You look at these Democratic Party pundits um, and operatives, and all they do is sit on Twitter all day congratulating one another for their insults about Donald Trump and for proving it again that Trump is a liar and a hypocrite, all of which is true, but it doesn't provide any kind of encouragement that Democrats are going to fare any better. And I think the most important point is that, yes, it was a close election, and yes, Hillary won the meaningless popular vote, but that is obscuring the fact that they don't have control of the House, they don't have control of the Senate, they don't have two-thirds of the governorships in the United States. They are one state legislator away from, from enabling the Republicans to literally amend the Constitution. It is a party that has collapsed and failed over the last eight years at every single level. And there's almost no reckoning. There's no questioning of what are we doing wrong and why are, is our messaging not resonating with voters? They're, they're just continuing on the same course, electing the same shitty politicians like Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, millionaires who represent Wall Street and corporate interests who have alienated voters over and over. There's no new voice. And that's why they're petrified of Keith Ellison, because they want to keep their stranglehold on the party and they want to implant one of their own apparatchiks, one of their own operatives, Tom Perez, who has proven himself so loyal to the Democratic Party establishment that even though he was supposed to be the left wing labor secretary representing the interest of workers, he continued to advocate for the TPP even when Hillary Clinton, albeit totally and sincerely, came out against it. That's how what a loyal soldier he is. And that's why they want to put him in into place. And he's just very kind of, you know, by all accounts, he's a nice guy. He's liberal. He has a good progressive record, all of that. But he's just everything about D.C. Democratic Party functionaries that people are tired of and that don't inspire anybody. Yeah, and I, I think also uh, you get a lot on Twitter, uh, you know, that they learn nothing. I don't know if it's that they haven't learned anything from the loss. I, it might be more they don't care. Because if you look at it, it's the same patterns. Elizabeth Warren, you know, she got a lot of credit uh, for uh, what happened the other day with her Coretta King speech and getting shut down. She's fairly progressive, but she made it into a, a fundraising letter. You had John Lewis a couple of weeks ago, obviously a civil rights icon, uh, when, when he had uh, all, all that going on and he was in the news going at it with Trump. He sent out a fundraising letter. I got an email from Donna Brazil last night, who mind-bogglingly is still the DNC chair, uh, about uh, Jeff Sessions is now attorney general. Donate now. I mean, I could go on and on. It seems like the default uh, action uh, is Trump's the boogeyman, send us money, which is pretty much what they did during the campaign. And now they're doing it after. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on just this repetitive pattern? Because it seems to me you said it so well. How do you have a resistance to, to President Trump? Uh, I'll, I'll read it here. It, it was a great passage. A failed collapse party cannot form an effective resistance. They're doing the same things over and over. I mean, I think that it's really important to take a step back and look at the broader trend and not get wrapped up in um, questions about how many votes Hillary lost by in the Rust Belt states and the Jim Comey letter and, you know, Donald Trump is gay lovers with Vladimir Putin and let's invoke homophobic themes to make fun of them for that. There's a much broader long-term and even global trend that is at play, which is, and, and we saw it as a great preview about what was going to happen in the 2016 election with the vote in the UK in favor of Brexit, which is that over the last 30 years, there have been these policies of free trade and globalization 
that have decimated industry, cost millions of people, not just their jobs, but their economic security, their way of life. Um, the Democrats have been fully on board with all of those policies that have caused those harms, and everybody knows it. Everybody knows that Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton were loud advocates of NAFTA in the 90s, of eliminating constraints on Wall Street, all of those policies of globalization that Obama was advocating TPP. And so the same thing in the UK, the same thing throughout Europe, you have tens of millions of extremely disaffected people who understand all the arguments about Brexit, about why it was dangerous and potentially risky, understood all the arguments about why Donald Trump was unstable and offensive, and yet they voted for these things anyway, and they're going to continue to vote for them because they despise the system that they're being told might be destroyed if they are disobedient. And even more, they hate the media and political elites who are telling them that they can't do this. And the Democrats played a big role in it because as people perceive correctly, their ultimate loyalty is to Wall Street and to bankers and to Silicon Valley and to corporate interests. They are represented not by working class people, but by millionaires and, and often even billionaires who fund them in Congress. And people who are worried about their future and economically downtrodden, and yes, as well, people who are therefore more susceptible to racist and, and xenophobic appeals, um, are going to continue to turn away from the Democratic Party until it changes. And they're not changing. There's no sign at all that they're going to change. They, they are continuing along the same kind of pattern. Yes, they throw rhetorical bones to their base the way they did by impotently voting against Jeff Sessions. Um, they'll, you know, do dramatic things that get them on cable talk shows, or as you say, that will fundraise well for their own personal political futures. But there's no fundamental reckoning about the identity of the Democratic Party, about the ideology that shapes it, about the interest it serves. And for as long as that's true, you can hashtag the word resistance all you want, think progress can sell shitty t-shirts for $40 that have the word resist on it, um, because, you know, near attendant and cap is going to lead the way. But until you have an actually positive agenda, which in turn requires a fundamental revision of how the party is constituted, who leads it and what it's for, the resistance will exist only symbolically, um, in name only. You'll have members of the base and people who want it to resist. As you say, these protests, especially the airport one, which is totally spontaneous and organic, the Women's March as well, we're inspiring, but there's no political vessel for those sentiments to express themselves. Instead, you have the Democratic Party that placates it, that appeases it, that manipulates it, that manipulates it, but at the end of the day serves interests completely antithetical to the ones they, that those people think um, it should be serving.